My name is Mike Savage. I'm Professor of Sociology here, and I'm one of the co-directors with John Hills of the International Inequalities Institute, which is very pleased to be hosting the, the book launch of um, Guy Standing's new book on basic income and how we can make it happen. I've had the pleasure of reading this book over the last week. It's a fantastically brilliant book. It's very comprehensive, very easy to read. It gives all the issues, and I, I, I thoroughly recommend it. I should say that Guy will be available to sign copies if any of you want to buy it. Um, he'll be here on the stage afterwards. So it's a tremendous, tremendous set of debates about basic income. Uh, I think there is a feeling that this is a kind of a key policy issue in the years to come, and it's really uh, great to have and to be hosting what should be a very important and interesting launch tonight. The plan will be for Guy to speak for about half an hour or a bit less, um, and then uh, he, during that talk, he's going to be showing a 12-minute film, which is showing how basic income has been introduced in certain parts of India, and gives a very practical sense about the issues around and the, su and the success of the basic income experiment. And then we'll pass on to the three discussants who will be speaking for five minutes or so each, and we'll make sure we have half an hour or so for discussion and questions at the end. So without further ado, let me say a few words about each of the speakers, and then we'll get cracking. Uh, many of you will know Guy Standing, a very, very significant figure in uh, development economics and, and, and in uh, developing policy repertoires around um, social change and political change. Um, I know him particularly because of his debates about the precariat, which I've been involved, involved in. But many of you will know he's been one of the leading figures behind the politics of basic income for many years. He's been professor at Bath and SOAS and was program director at the International Labour Organization, and he's advised the UN, the World Bank, and governments around the world. And then after him, we'll go on to Malcolm Torrey, um, who's sitting next to him, who's director of the Citizens Income Trust, visiting senior fellow in the Department of Social Policy at the LSE, and an Anglican priest. Um, we'll go on to Bob Jacobson, who's a welfare advisor at the Central London Charity that helps people with benefits, and she's been active in community organising for women, women's rights, housing, healthcare in London for over 30 years. And then finally, Magna Desai, who's Emeritus Professor of Economics at the LSC and is a Labour Life Peer. So it's a, it's a great panel. Um, it'll be a great evening. Let me ask Guy to make a start. Thank you very much, and it's, uh, I, I owe you sir, a vote of thanks for turning up in an evening and using some of your valuable time to come and listen to this presentation. And I was reflecting before I came here that over 30 years ago, it dates me, I wrote my first paper that was published on basic income, and the director of the London School of Economics, Ralph Darendorf, wrote the preface to it. And essentially, I was looking at the paper, and I thought, my goodness, it must be a very dull mind that is still saying roughly the same thing as he was saying over 30 years ago. But the context has changed dramatically. If I'd given a presentation on a book on basic income back in the early 1980s, there would have been the proverbial three men and a dog in the audience. And I think the interest that has spread in the last five years or even the last two years is partly to do with almost a perfect storm of developments that have come at the same time and have suddenly made the relevance of the issues around basic income so much more prominent. For a long time, we had the basic income European network, which evolved into the basic income Earth network. And I call those the doldrum years, because those were the years in which people said, basic income? You know, utopian or mad? You know, or very stupid. And it's only in the last five years, partly to do with technological developments, partly to do with the growth of insecurity, what I call the breakdown of the income distribution system of the 20th century, 
and partly, of course, due to the growth of political populism, a neo-fascist populism which has epitomized itself in the election of Donald Trump. And if I may say so, a lot of the sentiments behind Brexit and Marine Le Pen and a number of other of these characters. And I found in the last couple of years, a lot of mainstream corporate people, people that you wouldn't expect to have radical thoughts, have suddenly been coming out saying we've got to move in this direction. So there is something of a perfect storm in the factors that are pushing the debate into the mainstream. I think, looking at the election that we're just experiencing in Britain, that we're still talking about the politics of tomorrow, not the politics of today. But that, for those of us who've been involved over the years, is a big advance. And that's why when Penguin approached me to write this book, I said, come on, guy, you've got to, got to try and pull all of the stuff together that's been preoccupying you for over 30 years. And I would like to say, before I go on any further, to thank Maria Bedford and Isabel Blake, I think they're here from Penguin, I hope they are, for pushing me in this direction and supporting the work throughout the past year or more. Thank you very much. Now, this book is also the end of a trilogy. A trilogy which began with the precariat that Mike has mentioned about the growing class fragmentation taking place as the outcome of globalization in which millions and millions of people are entering the precariat. And none of the existing social policies None of the universal credit, the means-tested benefits, the behavior-tested benefits are reaching the precariat. And the precariat is being left facing chronic insecurity, chronic uncertainty in their lives, and they're getting very angry. I'm not going to go into the nature of the precariat, but I've been invited to speak to precariat groups in over 400 places in 37 countries. That doesn't happen to us academics, only in your nightmares. <laughs> but it's happened. And every single day I receive numerous emails from around the world from people who just want to tell me, I'm part of the precariat. I'm facing this problem, that problem, this insecurity, this lack of freedom, this lack. And they're very angry. And they have every right to be angry. And that's the contextual point that led through the first two books and into the third, and there are a few copies outside, the corruption of capitalism, the growth of rentier capitalism, which is a reflection of the breakdown of the income distribution system everywhere. More and more income is going to the rentiers, the owners of property of various sort, and less and less is going to the people who do work. Real wages are lower in Germany than they were 30 years ago on average. They're lower here, they're lower in the United States. They're lower in France. The system ain't working. And numerous people are working flat out and they won't escape poverty and insecurity. That's the context. So basic income is now suddenly becoming not such a utopian, wishy-washy, ideal thing. I can still have a few drinks and make it that way. <laughs> but it's coming back into the sense of debate that people like Thomas Paine, G.D.H. Cole, Bertrand Russell, and many of the great thinkers have touched on it. Martin Luther King. Many of them have been drawn to it, unfortunately, at a time when it couldn't make political progress. Now, what is a basic income? A basic income is, or should be, a regular small payment paid to every man, every woman, equally as a right, with a payment to the child that would be lower. 
It's paid unconditionally in behavioral terms, and it is paid as a non-withdrawable benefit. Now, the idea of a basic income morphs into another idea which is very similar, and when they wrote that first paper, I used the term social dividend. And that leads to the first justification for moving towards having a basic income for everybody. And that is it's a matter of social justice. The wealth and income of every one of us in this room is far more to do with the efforts of our ancestors than anything we've done ourselves and anything we will do ourselves. And pain and various people in his tradition understood that the wealth is a collective achievement. And in a sense, having a basic income in some form is like having a social dividend on the collective wealth. Part of the sharing. Just as you have inherited private wealth, you should have inherited social wealth. That fundamental justification, for me, is really the number one issue. Two years ago, I was invited to present the book on the precariat in Middlesbrough. I don't know if we have anybody from Middlesbrough here, but when I went to Middlesbrough, they took me around. Now, Middlesbrough in the 1820s was a village, a hamlet, and then they discovered iron ore. And within 15 years, Middlesbrough and Teesside around it became the hub of industrial capitalism, the hub of the industrial empire, and the wealth of all of us is due to Middlesbrough and places like it. Go to Middlesbrough today and you see the descendants of the people who created our wealth. They're mostly in the precariat. They're mostly reduced to being slobs waiting for odd jobs. But the toffs who made it the wealth, living down in the south of England, I hope not around the LSE, but in their estates and going to Eton and part of the cabinet, they made their wealth from Middlesbrough. And really, if you go to places like that, you will feel the sense, shouldn't they be sharing part of the wealth that's been created? And you can go to many places like that, and it sort of excites that emotional reaction. Now, I think also that you can argue that basic income today is part of an ecological justice. Pollution is a regressive development. The poor pay more. And in a sense, a basic income would be a compensatory mechanism that we could justify having taxes on polluters and repaying through having a basic income to losing citizens. The same with intellectual property. The growth of patents and copyright is a, is, is a ridiculously illiberal system which rewards the rentiers with monopoly income flows for 20 years, or in the case of copyright, for 70 years. Much of that income is going through no effort of anybody. It's often subsidized by you and me through subsidies given by the government, underwriting their risks, etc. So in a sense, you could have a levy on rental income to contribute to the building up of a basic income. That is the first justification. You can develop it, you can embellish it, the chapter, I hope, does so. But along those lines, I think you lead to a thinking of social justice, basic income, go together. The second justification for a basic income is that it would enhance freedom. Now, I have a very boring chapter on this subject where I discuss right libertarian, left libertarian and justifications. I'm not a libertarian myself. And then I turn to Republican freedom. 
Republican freedom, which goes back to Aristotle and Hannah Arendt, and you know the other people, I'm sure many of you are more expert than I am on the philosophic, philosophical foundations. But the essence of Republican freedom is the freedom to avoid being dominated by others, being dominated by people of unaccountable authority. And a basic income would strengthen the ability, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a panacea, but it would strengthen the ability to say no against an oppressive relationship, against an exploitative employer. The ability to walk and do the eyeball test. Alexis de Tocqueville's famous statement, meet the person in the street as an equal of status. That sense of freedom, Republican freedom, was brought out in the Indian pilots in ways that I will leave the film to tell you. But it's an important justification, and it leads to the following proposition, which has only struck me when I've been involved in doing pilots of basic income. The emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value of a basic income. I leave you hoping that you will buy the book and read why that should be so. But I assure you that if you have something which is scarce, you very quickly realize that a scarce commodity, the price rises because it's scarce. When you provide basic income, particularly in a community that has a shortage of money, the price of money falls. And when you have an accident or an illness or a contingency hazard of life, you suddenly find that your costs of living are not so great if you have a basic income. And that's what we've seen in the pilots. Another aspect of the freedom side is that a basic income gives people a greater sense of control of their time. We need a politics of time today. We're all stressed, or most of us are. A basic income would actually encourage people to slow down and have a less precarietized mind. The third ethical justification for a basic income is that it would reduce poverty, reduce inequality, if it's badly designed, it wouldn't do very well on those scores. I'm fully prepared to accept that. But a basic income would do something more important. It would give people a sense of basic security. And security is an asset. And the psychologists have taught us that if you have basic security, your IQ rises. If you have insecurity, your IQ diminishes. And people who've had the basic income in our pilots and other pilots have been showing that they have more mental health and the mental bandwidth, as they call it, is larger. And they make more strategic decisions. Experimental tests have shown that people who have basic income security translate that sense of security into their attitudes. They are more altruistic, they're more tolerant, they're more sociable. And there's a wonderful pilot that was done in North Carolina. It was an accidental pilot. And the accidental pilot was that a child development project, a longitudinal child development project took off in that area. And then shortly afterwards, by chance, the Cherokee Indian community in that area decided that it would distribute all its profits from its casino in the form of basic income payments to the families. So it was an accidental pilot because they had this ongoing longitudinal study alongside this basic income payment. And the remarkable thing was that the children in the families receiving the basic income developed much faster and further. 
so that by the age of 16 or 17, they were approximately one year ahead in their schooling, compared with these who were not receiving the basic income. But they looked deeper into the reasons. And the reasons seemed to be that the families that had the basic income had better interpersonal relationships, better calm, better decision-making, and a sense of conscientiousness developed. And that sort of relational development was the decisive factor in the outcome. Now, besides security, there are also the economic reasons. Now, most people who talk about basic income condemn it or support it by whether it's more efficient than other forms of social protection, means testing, universal credit, or whatever. In my view, our strength lies in those ethical issues and those developmental issues. But I'm quite happy to discuss the economic issues as well. I believe if you have a basic income, you will have more ecologically sustainable growth. It will reorient the activities towards reproductive activities rather than resource depleting activities. But it would also give us an instrument for an automatic macroeconomic stabler, stabilizer. For my pains, I've been asked to give a, a, a seminar in the Bank of England uh, later this month, and I'll be emphasizing the economic aspects of basic income in, in that talk. But one of the arguments that we've been making is that instead of a quantitative easing, which has been a basic income for bankers, <laughs> we should have quantitative easing for people and had the money that has been spent on quantitative easing, 375 billion plus plus in this country, 1,100 trillion euros in the Eurozone, plus plus, the same sort of amount in the United States. Had that sort of money been distributed even as a short-term basic income, we would have had a profoundly different outcome. Now they're all confessing the results the IMF have, the Bank of International Settlements. They've all come out with the evidence that quantitative easing as practiced by our government, by the Europeans and others, increase inequality, hardly helped with growth. A lot of leakages go to emerging market economies. Don't be surprised. But if we had used that money, we could have got the base. Now, there are a lot of other arguments I'm not going to go into because I haven't got the time. What the book tries to do is move through the arguments in favor, leading up to the economic arguments, the ecological arguments, yeah. He's told me I've got to shut up. <laughs> and then goes into the objections, the standard objections. I've counted 13 objections that have been made, the standard ones. And what I discuss is their arguments, our counter arguments, and the two big ones, of course, are it's unaffordable. That's number one. And there's a whole long chapter on how we could afford it. And as I wrote that chapter and consulted the fantastic empirical studies that have been done by people like Malcolm, by people like the Royal Society of Arts, like Compass, like various other groups that I should be mentioning, I realized that this is actually not such a big challenge. It's political. And then I started looking and saying, how would I like to afford it? And there are two ways I would like to afford it. And the first start stems from saying the way we must frame this debate is that basic income must be seen as a share of capital, not taxing strivers to pay 
Skyvers, as the classic Daily Mail would put it. We've got to have a levy on rental income. We've got to have a levy on the commons that are being plundered and things like that. Then I started to look at our incredible tax system. Are you aware of how many tax reliefs have been introduced? Which each and every one of those tax reliefs is effectively a, an income foregone. You're basically letting off somebody from paying tax that other people are paying. Well, they've managed brilliantly with great ingenuity to create a system where in this country there are 1,152 forms of tax relief. And the brilliant government, and I'm not being political here because I'm sure another brilliant government would have done the same, have done a costing of the 108 principal tax reliefs. They've also done an estimate of the lost revenue to government of 223 others. And then the rest, they, cut, they say, they can't estimate. I mean, come on. <laughs> but of the 108 principal tax reliefs, the estimate is that it costs the Exchequer £403 billion a year. Now, if I tell you that the total cost of the National Health Service of public schools, state schools, of social services, social housing, comes to approximately 470 billion pounds. You can see that just tax reliefs gets you enough to pay a very good basic income. And that leads to a crime. The biggest economic crime in my lifetime in this country was the privatizing of North Sea or Scottish oil. The Norwegians didn't do that. And they now have a fund that makes every Norwegian a crone millionaire. If there's anybody here who knows a Norwegian, date him or her. You're on to something. <laughs> You know, don't miss the chance. <laughs> Whereas we privatized and used it to make tax cuts on the wealthy, it's been estimated that had we established a sovereign wealth fund, it would today be worth over 670 billion pounds. Enough to pay out everyone in this country a reasonable basic income. We didn't do it, or our rulers didn't do it. But today, we are facing a challenge where we may miss another opportunity to move towards a basic income. The rest of the book deals with other aspects. And then if Mike will let me, I will now show a film, 13 minutes, which is a film of the results of our pilot that we've done in India where we provided 6,000 people, men, women, and children, with a basic income, and we compared what happened to them with a randomized controlled trial with the 6,000, a bit more than 6,000 others of similar background. And we're not professional filmmakers. We apologize in advance. We're all amateurs. I'm an economist, and therefore I'm useless at this. But some of our team have made this little film uh, and I'd like to show it to you and then wrap up. So if I can quickly get to the, oh, it's the, that one? Yeah. 
In the last two decades, the economic landscape of India has been constantly changing. This has led to the prosperity of some classes and sections. But much of the population has been left out in this process. These are the workers of the unorganized sector who continue to be economically insecure and unable to participate adequately in the process of economic growth. Although there are many welfare schemes that exist, they fail to reach the intended population due to lack of effective delivery systems. This was one of the reasons which led to the birth of Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA. SEVA is a binding force for almost 2 million women workers in the informal economy of India. As a national trade union, SEVA works to organize and empower its members by articulating their interests and voicing their concerns regarding public policy at the national and state level. In India, there are a lot of government schemes and the government spends billions of rupees every year in order to reach uh, schemes to the poor, to informal people, to, uh, for growth, for social security. However, much of that money actually does not reach. Poor women do need social security and the government does have the money. Is there not an easier way of reaching all that billions of rupees to women, to poor people, to the informal economy people? And one of the ways that has been recently discussed in India is that of cash transfers. So we ran this pilot and I must say we were very amazed at the results and we were also amazed at the enthusiasm of people who were part of this pilot. In 2011, SEVA, in partnership with UNICEF, launched the Basic Income Pilot Experiment in nine villages of Madhya Pradesh. The basic income payments were made up to 18 months to study their viability as a tool of social security for the poor. Uh, this मतलब शुरू किया हमने उसको इंप्लीमेंट किया इसको बहुत अच्छे से क्योंकि डिजाइन किया गया था बच्चों को भी पैसे दिए गए यूनिवर्सल रखा ऐसे गांव चुने जहां पर कि सो परिवारों परिवार के प्रत्येक सदस्य को पैसा दिया गया इस योजना के तहत एक साल तक हर परिवार को कुछ नगद पैसे दिए जाएंगे परिवार में जो वयस्क है 18 साल से ऊपर जो है उनको 200 रुपए मिलेंगे 18 साल तक जो बच्चे हैं उनको 100 रुपए मिलेंगे और ये पैसा जो है आपके बैंक के खाते में जाएगा लेकिन बैंक का खाता खोलना पड़ेगा उसी लिए दो महीने तक आपको हाथों हाथ नगद दिया जाएगा भाइयों के जो 200 रुपए भाई को मिलेंगे बहन का 200 रुपए बहन को मिलेंगे और बच्चों का जो है वो बहन के खाते में जाएगा आपको बराबर हर महीना 200 रुपए आपके खाते में आ जाएगा कोई शर्त नहीं आपको परिवार में आपको ही तय करना है इन ऑर्डर टू फैसिलिटेट दीस पेमेंट्स द प्रोजेक्ट स्टाफ मीडिएटेड विद बैंक ऑफिशियल्स एंड हेल्प्ड ऑल द विलेजर्स टू ओपन बैंक अकाउंट्स विद इन मंथ्स ऑल द 6041 रिसीपिएंट्स वर रिसीविंग बेसिक इनकम पेमेंट्स इन देयर बैंक अकाउंट्स thereafter to assess the impact of basic income payments and track its progress on about 1100 households the baseline survey interim evaluation survey final evaluation survey and a post final evaluation survey were carried out over a period of 18 months the results revealed a range of optimistic outcomes indicating the positive impact of this experiment the basic income is transformative and what we mean by that is that it has three overwhelming effects that are beyond all the individual specific outcomes the first effect is that it has improved the capabilities the potential of people in terms of schooling nutrition health and so on that's a very important set of issues sometimes called welfare but it's also important because it has an economic growth effect. It is developmental in the sense of stimulating the local economy 
and the local uh, multiplier effects of the outcomes are very important. The third aspect, which has been given very little attention in the cash transfer literature and even in the basic income literature, is that the basic income, even when it's very small, has an emancipatory effect. It is liberating people. बच्चों को स्कूल के टाइम में कोई पैसे की जरूरत पड़ती काफी किताब तो उसके पापा के पास नहीं होते तो वो पैसे जो मेरे पास रखे थे गुप्त में वो निकाल के उसको काफी पेन दिला देती कभी कहीं तबीयत तबीयत खराब हो गई तो उसपे भी खर्च किया जो बच्चे बकरी चराने पशु चराने The most visible impact was in the field of education, with increase of expenditure in paying school fees, purchase of shoes, books, and private tuition. अच्छा पहले के पैसे का क्या करा आपने या लेटरिंग वाले बच्चों आया बने का कहते अभी के साल में मिले बोले जैसे हमने पैसे मिले तो उसका हमने मकान बनाया वो मकान अच्छे से बनाया हमने ज़्यादा कर्जा वर्जा नहीं लिया कुछ भी किसी से उसके बाद हमने लड़की की शादी करी उसमें भी तो इसे ब्याज भी आप पैसा नहीं लिया ये बच्चे थे तो इसका इलम पे ये गर्भवती थी मैं तो फिर इलाज करवाने जाते थे मैं अस्पताल इसमें लग जाते थे सुपिता गरीब लोग जैसे कभी कोई बीमार दुखी हो गया अचानक कुछ हो गया तो अपने पास ये पैसा मिला पढ़ा रिया तो अपन लगा तो दे कोई भी बीमार दुखी हो जाए तो इन बेसिक इनकम विलेजेस द ओवरऑल इलनेस रेट वॉज मच लोअर एज कम्पेयर टू कंट्रोल विलेजेस ये पैसा तो हमने खान पीन पे खर्च किए तेल वगैरह अच्छे से मिल जाता दाल वगैरह भी अच्छे से मिल जाती है हरी सब्जी ले आते थोड़ी बहुत किलो दो किलो दाल एक खट्टी खरीद के ले आते हैं तेल एक खट्टा मिल जाता है हमको दो तीन किलो तेल एक खट्टा ले आते हैं चार पाँच किलो शक्कर एक खट्टी ले आते हैं अभी होली आई थी तब बच्चों का कपड़ा खरीद के नहीं लाए अब लाएंगे कपड़ा लता भी लिया हुआ में तेल साबुन भी लिया हुआ और खाना पीना सुधार हो रही हो अच्छी सुविधा मिल रही मतलब यू महीना भर में यू एक दो बार ना होता था यू हफ्ता में मतलब चार बार ना आई हम यू सुधार हो सर अच्छो मतलब इनिशियली द जेड स्कोर इंडिकेटिंग द लेवल ऑफ मेल न्यूट्रिशन अमंग चिल्ड्रेन were as low as 34 among the girls after one year of basic income this score moved closer to 61 inching closer to a normal curve for girls in the basic income villages when jab se abhi jo paise milne lag gaya ne jab se bahut badla hua ki koi na to gaay le li koi na bakri li koi na tv li hai koi na pankha liya hai कोई ने तो बच्चे की पढ़ाई में डाल दिया है कोई ने कि जमा कर लिया है पैसे बैंक में डाल दिया है तो बहुत बदला हो गया मैं पहले शुरू में मैंने एक जानवर लिया था एक का मैंने चालीस जानवर कर लिया और हता बचत का हता हमने दो बैल ले लिया एक बकरी ले ली और बच्चा बच्चे उनका पढ़ाई भी करी और हमने कहीं करी हो कि जो हमें छोटो मोटो कर जो वो कर जो दे दो जिका बाद में सेवाड़ी से यो भी करी हम नहीं सौ रुपया बचत भी करी पानी तो क्या था हमने सोचा कि कुछ कुछ उपयोग करा है तलाब पानी से तो हमने बारह जना ने समेत बनाई पैसा इकट्ठा किए तो इसकी हम मछली का बच्चा लाया तो चौबीस हजार में लाए हम एक लाख नौ हजार बच्चा तब भी तलाब पानी में है अभी तो भी गर्मी में निकाल आएंगे कभी भी एक लाख डेढ़ लाख का बच्चा बिक जाएगा वहाँ ये जो पैसा मिल रहा है उसी पैसे से खरीदी आपने तो आपके अकेले के पैसे किए हैं कि सबके मिला के पैसे हैं? इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ वॉज मोस्ट विजिबल इन द ट्राइबल विलेजेस एस्पेशली अमंग वेमेन मोस्ट ऑफ देम यूज टू अर्न देयर लिविंग फ्रॉम लेबर वर्क बट सिक्सटी सिक्स परसेंट बिगैन फार्मिंग देयर ओन लैंड बाई द एंड ऑफ बेसिक इनकम एज कम्पेयर टू ओनली थर्टी थ्री परसेंट इन कंट्रोल विलेजेस पहला ऐसा नहीं होता था किसी से बात नहीं करने देते थे अरे कहा कहाँ का आया वो तो कहाँ जाए माँ अच्छा। हाँ पहले नहीं बोलते थे फिर इंजू कर को हम घर में भरा जाती थे हम नहीं बोलते थे आदमी के सामने अच्छा। अब हमारा आदमी नहीं बोलते ऐसे कि कहाँ जाए कहा नहीं अच्छा। जाते रहे को बुलाए सेवा वाला आया अपना पहले खूब पीते थे लोग सर आप हाँ अब नहीं पीते अब बहुत होने छोड़ दी बीस रुपया बॉटल मिलती दारू 
अब बीस रुपया बचेगा तो बीस रुपया का कभी सामान ले आऊँगे नमक है मिर्ची कुछ भी ले आएंगे तो घर में न शराब को क्या पी लेगा न घर में उल्टा झगड़ा करेगा जैसे किसी से अपन पैसे मांगने जाओ या कोई किसी को ये बनाओ कि नहीं तुम मेरे को पैसे दो फिर वो भी आज ले तीन का चार का तो ये ऐसा नहीं कर सकते गुलामी जैसा काम नहीं होगा गुलामी जैसा काम नहीं होगा पहले क्या गुलामी करते थे लोगों की अब नहीं करना पड़ते पहले क्या वो बड़े बड़े लोगों से पैसे लेना था जिसी के पास जमीन है तो ओके पटेल वहाँ पैसे चाहिए कि आज दस हज़ार आ जाना ले जाना दस का ब्याज लगेगा दांगे देना पड़ता है और वो देने से क्या होता है कि आज की तारीख बता दी अपन वही तारीख को पैसे चुका दो तो ठीक है नहीं तो कोई घर में से सामान निकाल जाएंगे नहीं तो फिर अपन को रकम बेच को देना पड़ता ऐसा करना वो नहीं हो रहा अब ऐसे नहीं कर रहे आप लोग पैसा नहीं रहे किसी के हाथ जोड़ने जाए तो बहुत बुरा लगता है कि वो कह दी उठा के कह दे कि नहीं है मेरे पास में तो वो लटका घर आ जा नहीं वो रहे अपने पास में तो कोई डर वाली बात तो नहीं रहनी बहुत बड़ी मदद हुई तो मदद ये हुई कि हमको पैसा मिलता गया था लोगों से लेके नहीं आया सर हम उधार नहीं लाए लोगों की मेहनत नहीं करी नहीं तो हमारे महीना भर काम करिए दो सौ ले जा महीना भर उनका गोबर सो रहो उनकी दाढ़ की करो ये नहीं करा सर हमने ये बहुत अच्छा हुआ हमारे संग तो ये कैसा लगा ये कार्य बहुत अच्छा लगा वितरण हुआ अच्छा लगा हमें तो बहुत बढ़िया लगा सर और तुम लोग आओ तो हमें बहुत अच्छा लगे ऑल दो द रिजल्ट ऑफ दिस पायलट स्टडी हैव बीन प्रोमिसिंग द क्वेश्चन नाउ इज वे डू वी गो फ्रॉम हियर एज दिस स्टडी हैज शोन बाय लिंकिंग द पुअर रूरल एंड ट्राइबल कम्युनिटीज टू द मेन स्ट्रीम वाय द बैंकिंग सिस्टम एंड ट्रस्टिंग दैम to make their own financial and welfare decisions their lives can be transformed drastically if one move can make such a difference one can only imagine what a nationwide movement will result in Thank you very much. It's still, even though I've seen it probably a hundred times, it's still emotional. The great thing is that in January, January the 31st this year, the Minister of Finance tabled in the Indian Parliament, alongside the budget statement, a report which says it has a whole chapter. On basic income, and the essence of the report is that yes, we could afford it in India, and the debate has led already to a huge amount of interest. A lot of politicians have come round, and Meghnad will talk about it shortly. If you are interested, we have another book on on the results, the statistical results from the project. I'd like to end on that point, even though most of the book is about developed country issues. The big challenge, I think, is political now. The big challenge is to think of it as part of a good society. And there is a chapter that I won't discuss in detail, but I hope some of you will read it and use it for research. Without a doubt. All the results from the pilots that I've been involved in and other people have been involved in in various countries, rich and poor, have shown that if you have a basic income, people work more, not less. And when they work, they're more productive and more cooperative, not less. It overcomes things like the poverty trap, the precarity trap. But it also motivates people to do more care work, more community work, more work that is of social value, not necessarily working for a boss. But I think that part is part of the emancipatory agenda before us. So I thank you very much for listening, and I hope the discussions will add to the conversation.
This book is classic guy standing. If you've read any of his other books, you'll know what I mean by that. It is passionate and academic at the same time. It's comprehensible, comprehensive, and it's cumulative in its argument. There's a great deal that will be familiar to you, and I'm not going to repeat what Guy has said about the book, except do read it. What I shall do is extend some of Guy's arguments, because sometimes they are very, what he writes in the book is thought provoking, and it provokes extra thought. Guy says that a basic income would promote economic growth. Here we might combine two of the arguments found in the book. Basic income schemes paid for with new money would, of course, by themselves promote economic growth. But the kind of revenue neutral scheme that would pay for basic incomes by making changes to the current tax and benefit system would also promote economic growth if at the same time it redistributed from rich to poor because the less well off have a greater propensity to consume and are more likely to buy local goods. Those two arguments need to be fitted together. Guy suggests that a basic income would be a useful economic stabiliser. Basic income on its own would unfortunately be less of an economic stabiliser than means-tested benefits because the latter rise as wages fall and the amount spent on them rises as unemployment, unemployment rises, whereas basic incomes would remain constant. Hence, you need to read alongside that part of his argument his suggestion for a varying additional stabilisation payment. It seems to me that the agenda of the first part of Chapter 5, when you fit it together, is an argument for the kind of basic income scheme that retains and recalculates means-tested benefits and that makes sure that it redistributes from rich to poor. In Chapter 7, Guy calls such schemes hybrid. I'm not sure that's quite the right word. I'd like to suggest another one to you, Guy. Because these basic incomes in those schemes are genuine, pure basic incomes. They are unconditional, non-withdrawable, they are individual. Maybe the word combined would be a better one. A combined scheme is one that pays a genuine basic income and at the same time retains means-tested benefits but recalculates them all downwards because people now have their basic incomes. Guy is rightly sceptical about predictions of a jobless future. He is occasionally sceptical, you know. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but just every now and then, Guy is sceptical. Um, and, but he does foresee a continuing rise in inequality to which a basic income would be a solution, which, of course, it might be if the scheme were to be designed to be redistributive. I would add an additional argument, that a basic income would cohere with any future labour market configuration, whereas the current tax and benefits system is only appropriate to the labour market of the 1950s. So, if we don't know the future shape, of the employment market, the safest option for this country and anywhere else is a basic income. In chapter six, Guy replies to a series of frequently made objections, which he's referred to, often with brief responses that invite yet more further reflection. In relation to affordability, we might add that in the absence of additional public funds, a basic income could easily be funded by adjusting the current tax and benefits system. I too would like to see the kind of um, additional public expenditure from a variety of sources that Guy would like to see. But in the current climate, the current cl political climate, we may need a first step. That is funding as basic income from out of the current tax and benefit system so that we can then later on move on to other funding sources. 
In relation to the suggestion that a basic income might provide a pretext for demolishing public services, I would suggest that here is another argument. There are different kinds of conditionality, not just one. The National Health Service is characterised by unconditional access to services, whereas child benefit is unconditional equal provision. These are utterly different unconditionalities, and the one cannot be substituted for the other. In response to the objection that a basic income would be something for nothing, we might add that reciprocity can happen in either direction. It can start in either of the two ends of the spectrum. And that a basic income, by providing financial security and ameliorating labour market disincentives, would enhance our ability to contribute to society. That kind of reciprocity is just as much reciprocity as demanding something from the population before they're allowed to receive anything. And against the objection that a basic income would depress wages, we might add that the basic income should be understood as a static, static subsidy for wages, which it is, but that it does not rise as wages fall, whereas means-tested benefits that rise as wages fall and therefore act as a dynamic subsidy are a far more damaging subsidy to wages. Chapter 7 on affordability deserves careful study. If you haven't seen it before, then buy the book and read page 147 and then, and then try it on anybody who hasn't bought the book and persuade them to buy the book. I'm not going to tell you what it says. You're going to have to... <laughs> it's very well put. <laughs> Chapter 7 also quite rightly points out that existing research on illustrative basic income schemes, and here's a criticism in the book to my own work, um, including my own, uh, don't take into account feedback effects. That's absolutely right. We don't, and it would be nice if we did, and I entirely agree with Guy on this point. We know from pilot projects that a basic income would improve health and educational outcomes, and would increase own account economic activity. It would be so useful to be able to quantify the financial consequences of that and to be able to include those consequences in evaluations of illustrative basic income schemes. Maybe some of you looking for PhD subjects might like to have a go at some of that because it is really complicated. All that I would add to chapter nine is that a national minimum or living wage and social insurance benefits are not necessarily alternatives to basic income as stated in the book. I can understand what Guy means by that. They are very different from basic income, but they could both live happily alongside a basic income and would be more effective in that context than they are alongside the current tax and benefit system. Nobody anywhere will be able to add anything to chapter 10 on basic income and development. And there's very little that anyone could add to chapter 11 on pilot projects. Guy is the world authority on both. And here you have his distilled wisdom. The only genuine basic income pilot projects ever to have been undertaken have been those in Namibia and India organised by Guy Standing. It is not just Sewa that was behind that lot. The appendix on how to carry out a pilot project is based on deep experience and should be pinned to the wall above the desk if anyone thinking of running a basic income pilot project. And I would invite you to evaluate the various so-called pilot projects going on around the world in relation to the appendix in the book, and then you can decide whether they are basic income pilot projects or not. The book subtitle, How We Can Make It Happen, is not a question. Guy believes that the way to do it is to argue for basic income on the basis of social justice, freedom and basic security, and strategic preparedness, he calls it, for possible technological disruption of the employment market. The book as a whole suggests something else as well. It suggests that there is a multitude of arguments for basic income. I lost count as I was reading through the book. And it is the cumulative nature of those arguments that is driving and will continue to drive the current debate. If you want to read a longer version of this review, then you'll find it on Citizens Income Trust website. That's my own little advert. But more importantly, Please do buy two copies of the book. 
it's very cheap, and I'm going to have a word with my own publishers about the price I put on my books. <laughs> Buy two copies of the book, read and keep one of them, and give one to someone who really ought to read it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Touched. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Hi, and thanks, Malcolm, for the great tracy of the book. I thought that was excellent, and it saves me the, the bother of it. Um, yeah, I, I was first attracted to basic income um, when, I, when I was a, well, I'm still a welfare advisor, um, and really my main aim with basic income is to make myself redundant. Um, I think, you know, we, I have to use the, um, the Child Poverty Action Group book, which gets bigger and bigger every year, and is just at phenomenal this year uh, with the combination of the current benefits with, along with universal credit. Um, but what we've developed at the moment, I think, is really a system of sadism, of sort of state-sanctioned sadism, um, not just against people with disabilities, but also uh, people who can't find work. And what's happening now is that um, the non-take-up rate of unemployment benefit is starting to edge towards 60%. Uh, what people are doing is that they're getting into debt uh, with family, friends, anybody that they can borrow from in order not to get onto the benefit system, so that by the time they actually come to us uh, to, to help them with that, uh, they are, they've broken all the relationships they need to exist on benefits in, a, in an okay way. I've also been on income support, for, I was on income support for many years uh, because I wanted to raise my own child um, and had a kind of basic income with the income support system that was on at the time. Um, what I'd like to talk a, bit, a little bit about is how do we, how do we get there? It's certainly something that's occupied my mind for the last three years. Um, and it's a difficult question, really. Um, at the moment, I mean, I'm from the left, and at the moment, uh, we're fighting a lot of survival battles which really can't just be set aside in order to uh, talk about basic income. Um, so what we've done uh, at Basic Income UK is we've uh, put together a very short statement which we're trying to get people, uh, both individuals and, and any kind of organization, whether that's a union or a sports club or a music club or anything, uh, to, to endorse, uh, because we'd like to sort of show that there is actually quite a groundswell of opinion for this. Um, another thing we've been doing is we've been going out on the street and talking to people about this, and one of the things that's been really, really exciting is that when people get it, and it is actually quite difficult to get people to stop and talk to you, because nobody believes anything can happen at the moment, and certainly what David Graeber's called it, the, the, the war on the imagination over the last 40 years has had a huge, huge effect. But when they do talk to you and they, and they do get it, um, the light in people's eyes is really amazing because they can, they, they can imagine the money in their own pocket and what it can do for them. Um, and that's been one of the most inspiring things that we've, that we've been doing as, as Basic Income UK. Um, I've also been very much involved with um, Unconditional Basic Income Europe until last month, I think it was. Um, I was chair of the board there, um, and, it's, and that had its own kinds of challenges in trying to sort of organize across language barriers, uh, actual borders, what the EU is doing. I mean, we're, we, we just consider anybody who wants to consider themselves as a European to be a, a potential member of our organization, so we're not particularly... Um, we're not particularly uh, prescribed to the EU, um, but of course a lot of our focus has been on the EU. Um, and it's been really an amazing experience, um, just the, the kinds of people I'm meeting and, uh, and the kinds of things that we're starting to do. I uh, just wanted to talk about a couple of our projects. Uh, one which is mentioned by Guy in, the, um, in, in his book is the Euro Dividend. Uh, we're working very to gather together um, a, a scholarship and, and ideas about how to do a Euro dividend. Um, of course, it probably would just be in the Eurozone uh, to start out with, but hopefully we can get that expanded. Um, and we're, yeah, so hopefully in the next sort of, say, six to eight months, uh, look out for a, conf a conference probably in, in Brussels or in Berlin. Um, and that would give everybody uh, that would give everybody about sort of 200. The way it's been set out by Philippe Van Parij is is that it would give everybody um, about 200 euros a month, which of course doesn't sound like a whole lot in this country, but uh, in places like Bulgaria, Romania, and Greece would would be really really significant 
uh, significant up boost, and there's been quite a lot of interest in it. Um, I think the other, the flip side of the of the whole kind of immigration and, and Brexit debate has been that you know not everybody wants to move, and a lot of people are forced to move, particularly in the in the poorer countries of well of anywhere in the world, but certainly in Europe, where um, you know people just simply you know particularly young people just simply can't make a living there, um, and what that's doing it's also shifting the politics in those countries and it's also draining them of the kind of talent and energy that they need to really build their economies. Another thing, another project that we're working on is an agrarian basic income, um, simply because there's uh, the whole the whole cap. The, we've got the cap monies right there, which we can show uh, would actually be much better used just to give every every person who works on the land a basic income, so that they can they can con continue to survive. If people know about cap, it's currently base, it's mainly used to subsidize large landowners and agribusiness, um, and we would also like to change that. So those are two things. Um, please look at, have a look at our website, which is basicincome.org.uk. You'll find the statement there. Um, and again, this is really about building power. That's why we've been uh, working a lot with the unions in this country, which we've been fairly successful with. Uh, the TUC passed a motion for it. Uh, Unite has passed a motion for it. GMB has passed a motion for it. And they also hosted our, our European Congress uh, a couple, a uh, few weeks ago. Um, and it's it's a it's yeah I think I think basically the unions are really starting to get it. Uh, Unison is is also getting close to it. One more thing um, is that I I do feel after the three years that I've been doing I do feel that it really needs to be argued for on a very local level, and that your local groups you know any local groups that you that you can get together to support this would be great. Um, where we've seen in Europe, I mean most of the pilot uh, ideas have come from. Uh, people who've really argued for it very strongly within their own communities and, and got local politicians. And we just saw in Glasgow and Fife uh, people that, 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 want to, that want to have their own pilots. So I would really recommend uh, trying to do this on a local level and with your neighbors and with your housing estates or with your unions or whatever, your sports groups, whatever it is that, that you would like, you know, you, you think would benefit, whatever people you think would benefit from basic income. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Guy. I think it's one of the most useful books you've ever written. And, <laughs> and if you, no, it's great. You know, if you're going out on the street, there's a lot of arguments in there. He, you know, answers quite a lot of the objections to basic income. And um, yeah, so that's what we're here to do is sell the book, right? <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Guy Standing for making me feel young again. Uh, 30, 35 years ago, he and I and Malcolm were uh, you know, fighting in this field, and nobody was taking the blindest notice of us. He has persisted, and I congratulate him on his persistence, and he has waited for the good climate now, and we all wish him great luck. Uh, I tried to propose basic income to the Labour Party way back in the 1990s, and uh, there were no takers. Uh, no, why is, for example, by contrast, India considering universal basic income? Because if affordability is the issue, a poor country should be running away from uh, universal basic income than any other. No, I have, I have a couple of uh, hypotheses. Being an economist, I have to have a hypothesis. Uh, let me give you an, uh, another story first. A few years ago when Gordon Brown was prime minister, or maybe a little bit before, there was a scheme to have identity cards in the UK. And the great London School of Economics in its infinite wisdom said it was too expensive. Couldn't possibly have a card. India has created a billion identity cards, just a billion. Why? Because they use ingenuity and modern technology, which unfortunately had not visited London School of Economics at that time. <laughs> but that's life, because we are an advanced country. 
we can't do certain things. You have to be a poor country to do things properly. And the same thing has happened in this case. In India, there has been an anti-poverty program since 1971. And it was sort of, you know, usual pay people below the poverty line. You decide a poverty line, pay people below the poverty line X rupees uh, per, per month, you know, thing like that. And then obviously, due to political pressure, uh, the poverty level has been revised upwards. And so for about 40 years, there has been a anti-poverty program and the proportion of people under the poverty line has come down. It's about 20% odd now, it used to be 60%. Now, the interesting part of that is that there is a program going with a lot of experience and the other sort of welfare programs are not many. I'm saying this because as, as Barb said, if you look at our welfare state program, it's a huge, thick book. And the huge, thick book has created vested interest among the welfare benefit receivers. And very often, be welfare benefit receivers, who may only be getting 50p more than somebody else, are unwilling to give up those 50p. So you can't say, well, let's remove all this and create basic income. You have to create basic income on the top of those things. And that's where affordability thing comes. What in India they're contemplating is, can we, as it were, get together some of these uh, schemes and replace them by universal basic income? And as Guy was saying, every year, along with the budget, the day before the budget, uh, or along with the budget, uh, there is an economic survey published. And this year's economic survey was devoted to universal basic income. And there's a very active debate on basic income. That's another uh, difference between here and India, that there are about 50 economists emailing each other right now about what kind of basic income, what to do, what not to do. And there's a very active thing. And there is a man called Vijay Joshi, who is at Oxford. He, has, he proposed in his book that universal basic income was affordable in India. Now, so you really have a revolutionary uh, kind of step forward. You know, Lenin said that when the revolution comes, it'll come from Beijing and Calcutta and take over London and Paris. Well, this may be the case that the basic income will come from, from the East and take over the West. Because they have calculated that ultimately replacing some of the benefits, not many, not all benefits, will create enough saving in the per capita income in the government's budget to be able to afford a universal basic income for everybody. Now, you know, you are, you are, you're trying to give uh, universal basic income to 800 million people. Uh, and so, you know, uh, numbers are such that uh, uh, even Diane Abbott would have difficulty uh, <laughs> calcul calculating. But uh, you know, let, let me just give a, a simple example, if I have, if I have a minute. Uh, I, I, I was uh, somewhat maverick, and I didn't want to get into universal basic income because uh, people were saying, you know, why should we pay the, you know, the Ambani's who are billionaires, you know, basic income, and those those arguments. So. I said, now let's, let's, very simple calculation. You, what proportion of the per capita income do you want to pay as a basic income? One question. And what proportion of the people, of the population, you want to uh, give basic income? Of course, if it's universal basic income, you might want to give 100%, uh, you know. So then, if you want to give 100% people universal basic income, then the proportion of total income you can spare will determine uh, what proportion. So if you, if you want to give everybody 10% of basic income, that uh, from the GDP you have to give up 10%. So I said, now how, how about this? Let us give uh, only women universal basic income. Uh, and so basically that is it half the population. So if you want to give 10% of uh, uh, per capita income as basic income, 
5% of GDP will give all women a basic income. And the nice thing about that is that uh, uh, there can be no more deserving case than women because at a variety of levels, they work both in the paid and unpaid field and, and they contribute enormously uh, to welfare. So uh, I, I've, I've flown that kite. I don't think anybody's gonna take the blindest bit of notice. But uh, what is true is that within the next two years or so, India will have a universal basic income. And when you know 800 million adults get it, 850, sorry, 850 million adults get it, that will change the way the world perceives basic income. It can be done, it can be done by a poor country, and if it can be done by a poor country, it can be done by anybody. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. We have, we have uh, just over 15 minutes for questions, and um, I, sus I suggest we take them in groups of three. We have some microphones, one upstairs and one downstairs. So who wants to begin at the back there, the guy at the back in the blue shirt? Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, Guy, and thank you everybody for your presentations. I was just wondering um, who you think is entitled to basic income? Because if it's people's ancestors, I wonder if it's just British people's ancestors who are entitled to sort of British capital, or maybe ancestors of people around the world who've contributed. And if it's resources, whose resources? Are the resources of Britain not the property of everybody in the world? Thanks. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we'll ask. Um, uh, yep, up here. Uh, thanks to the whole panel. Um, I was just interested to um, find out if the, uh, particularly from the case studies in India, uh, if the, anyone reported any negative effects. I know these videos are very nice and shiny and tell you all the wonderful things. Did anyone say there was anything they felt didn't seem to work and uh, what problems were there? Thanks. And one more, next, next door, yeah. Thank you. Um, it's sort of a question for Malcolm, but I'd be interested to hear what everyone said. Do you, um, said there's a big distinction between uh, universal provision versus universal access, and especially in relation to public services. Um, how, yeah, how can we make sure that uh, universal, sorry, universal basic income um, isn't used in as, as an excuse to erode public services? Okay. This on? Yes. Uh, on the first question, uh, there's a long, boring section on that very question in the book because it's often put to us. And, and I think we have to be pragmatic, obviously. There's no perfect answer to it. Ironically, uh, a great book written by a famous son of the LSE, Michael Young, uh, who looked at poverty in the East End of London. And one of the key findings of that book was that the shift to means testing where you target just the poor, means that the migrants tend to go to the front of the queue because they tend to be the poorest of the poor, and that this excites anti-migrant feeling and xenophobia. Now, a basic income would get around that problem. So you, you're comparing a new basic income type scheme with means testing, because that's effectively what you, you'll be doing. And, and what you would be doing with a, a basic income is you say, look, everybody, every usual resident who is legally resident in Britain, say, is that's the community, would be entitled to the basic income. And you would say, look, it's a pragmatic rule. It's not an ideal rule. If I was a philosopher king and wanted to have an ideal world, utopia, it would be different. But as a pragmatic rule, you could say that, okay, a legal migrant when they come into Britain would have to have a period when they would not be receiving the basic income, and after a period, they would qualify for the basic income. That is a pragmatic rule, which I think most people would understand as fair. You know, it's a fair, and it would reduce 
this idiotic situation we've got at the moment of, of blaming migrants for all sorts of things and demonizing migrants. It's our current system which helps create that anti-migrant feeling. A basic income is actually a way of, of moving towards a more fair system. But, but ultimately, the, your philosophical point about going back to Thomas Paine and our ancestors and things, again, I think you just have to say, look, this is a justification for social uh, uh, dividends and sharing of the wealth. And the obvious starting point is the is your citizen and the citizens who are living in your in your domain? Um, the the second question, or the second question, was put to me. It was very interesting because uh, we've asked, be, always been asked that question, perfectly legitimate question. And I I used to go to some of those villages in the course of the two years when we were doing it because it was extended for two years. There was one statement that's wrong there, and and. I would go up and I would ask people, look, uh, you know, how are you getting on? How does it feel? And there would always be one, one somebody would say, well, there's one group who really hates the scheme. They hate it. They're really angry with you. The money lenders. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so that you can't please everybody. You have the third one. Yeah. This work. Yeah. Um, I have been asked this question often. I was a few years ago on um, a platform with Lawrence Mead, the um, the academic from the United States, who was, in one sense, on the same side, thinking a basic income would be an interesting idea because you could abolish everything else. Um, that's not quite how I saw it. And uh, so we had a bit of an argument. Um, and it's, it, it, that crystallized for me the, the seriousness of the question because it is perfectly possible to see that um, a basic income established by a government of a, of a certain kind might decide to use it as justification for abolishing other public services. Um, there, are, there are at least two arguments against allowing it to do that. One is that there really are different kinds of unconditionality. And this came home to me most powerfully a few years ago when my brother's um, partner, Charlotte, died of leukemia. She had had, we worked out, something like half a million pounds probably spent on her by the NHS, trying everything that could possibly be tried. Whereas my father, I mean, he's, he's dead now, but as, as far as we know, he never cost the National Health Service anything. Um, what the National Health Service offers is unconditionally of access. It is free at the point of use, and that's, that's that at the point of use is, a, is an essential part of the formula. You can't replace that with an equal, unconditional provision of something like an income, a child benefit is unconditional um, income, it's provision. Um, so first of all, th th those two uh, unconditionalities are utterly different from each other and they should never be, uh, be confused with each other. Secondly, the, uh, if you were to give people a basic income, even a very high one, and say to them, now you can buy your own insurance um, and from which your uh, health costs will be paid. Unfortunately, the way we run the NHS is the most efficient way of running a health service. And uh, the, 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 some, some, um, some statistics regularly put out by uh, a, a foundation in the United States shows that. And if you're interested in this subject, um, I'm afraid you have to wait till later in the year when, see I have a variety of research interests, it's not just this. Um, I've contributed two chapters to the new handbook on primary care ethics, and it will come out later this year, and one of those is on the, the economics of the National Health Service. And it shows how and why the, the insurance principle, the pay per item of service principle, um, simply cannot come up to the efficiency of 
a national health service paid for out of general taxation in which general practitioners are the, uh, are the, the gatekeepers and therefore the rationing process. Um, it, there, is, there is no competition and you only have to look at the statistics to prove it. Not that Lawrence Mead was having any of that, um, uh, but, but it's, it's a very important subject. And uh, the, the, the third argument is this. Um, if you were to fund a basic income out of the current tax and benefits system, then what you're effectively doing is turning personal, income tax personal allowances into a basic income. You are turning parts of means tested benefits uh, into a basic income. And so nothing actually, in some ways, nothing new is happening. You can see a basic income as a radical transformation process, like Guy's book does, or you can see it as a minor administrative change that makes the income system that we have in this country much more efficient. It is an interesting <coughs> policy because it's actually both. And if you look at it the second way, you can see why there is no actual argument for saying we can use this to destroy the health service any more than you could use the income tax burst allowances or means tested benefits as a pretext for destroying the National Health Service. Um, there's three arguments to be getting on with. I'm very happy to discuss them more Can I just say something, yeah, just on this as well. I mean, of course, what we're experiencing right now is that the, the cuts are actually destroying our services without a basic income. That's happening already. All right, and I think the real thing is, is that we need to, again, build our power to both, uh, re you know, both re refund our, our services, but also do a basic income. But one thing I wanted to say as well is that the fact that we've been on, a, on this kind of defensive stance about services um, has meant that, for the last 30 years really, is that, you know, has meant that we haven't really had a chance to think through what do we really want from those services and how should they really be, you know, how is the best way to organize them. One of the uh, campaigns I was involved with before I got involved with this was to save our local health center from uh, the primary care trust selling it off. And there I could see um, that, that the way the NHS was organized um, was a mess. Now obviously the reforms since then have not made it any better, and in fact they've made it a lot worse. Um, but I really do think that, that with, say, a basic income, we can have a chance to actually think through how we want to do public services, whether that's health care or education or particularly social care. So I hope, you know, that's one of the things I hope for with the basic income is that we'll have a chance to do that. Okay. We've got time for one more round of questions. I can see people upstairs, upstairs wanting to speak. Up, up yep. Upstairs, yeah. Yep. Front here in the grey jacket. Cheers. So, um, thanks for the talk. I've actually got two questions, so I wrote them down. Um, so, you've been preaching basic universal guaranteed income for the last 30 years and not made too much progress in terms of, like, um, I guess, crossing the chasm into mainstream uh, majority acceptance. Um, so, in terms of, um, do you not think that you need to change the positioning or messaging of um, basic income, much like perhaps climate change, um, people need to change how they approach um, cl climate change in terms of um, they need to move more towards like creating clean tech jobs rather than saving the environment. And the second question is, um, how do you marry basic um, income with an increasing aging population where less and less people will be working and living for far longer? Okay, there's another, another guess, yep, tap on the tie there. Yep. Thanks a lot. Um, a question for everyone, but probably focus towards Bob first. Um, you mentioned there are a whole host of survival and justice issues which we have to consider alongside UBI, um, but I'd be just sort of intrigued to hear how far all of you think that UBI could be a, a solution to most of those social and, and justice issues. Okay, are there any more down here? There's lots of people. Sorry, one more time. Um, <laughs> who was first? The woman in the red uh, jumper there. Um, we never did the microphone. Um, I'm just wondering what will it take uh, to get these ideas into the uh, into the in into the mainstream. 
what what sort of crises do we have to have before they start <laughs> listening? Okay, I think I think uh, what, one more question. I think is the last one over there, woman in the in the swither colour jacket, and then and then we'll let Guy finish. I think because we should have a few words to, to wrap up. Um, thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering, um, what role do you envisage the corporates and the private sector um, have in, oh well, in, in making basic income happen? Okay, so I think, I think we'll just let Guy to finish and respond to those questions if he can. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, the questions and for staying so long. I just want to make a comment on, uh, on Malcolm's point about uh, Lawrence Mead. Lawrence Mead is an evangelical... And one of the first things that David Cameron did when he became Prime Minister was to ask him to come to Downing Street to advise on social policy reform. He's a friend of uh, Ian Duncan Smith. And Lawrence Mead has, has written what I'm about to say as well as said it in various venues. He says that it's essential to make benefits mean and demeaning for people and to encourage them as much as possible to not be able to obtain benefits. It tells you a lot about a person. And uh, they've done rather well. And we've got the new thing of universal credit coming in, where under the rules, you're going to have to wait six weeks before you can begin to claim it. You will then have another two or three weeks before you get anything, if you are lucky. Now imagine you are an impoverished person who's been living off a casual job without benefits, in and out of jobs, and you have debts, and you're expected to wait eight or nine weeks. That's the sort of divisive social policy we are getting in the 21st century. We should all be furious about that sort of thing, all of us, without exception. It could be any of us, but that's not the point. It's others. And that sense of empathy is so fundamental to basic income. The ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes. That's what motivates, I think, the believers in basic income. The ones I know, not the libertarians, but the, the ones who want to see it, not as a panacea, but part of a new social policy. Now, the cynical question from the back, you know, Carl, you, what, you've been wasting 30 years of your life, you've been advocating this policy, you haven't seen any success, why don't you do something else to entertain yourself? That sort of line. Now, I think we've actually made a lot of progress a hell of a lot of progress. When we see a basic income in India, or in Namibia, or in Ontario, or in California as we're about to launch, or in Finland, or in Dutch cities, and you say we haven't made any progress, I have short Anglo-Saxon words. But there's another, there's another point, which is that Milton Friedman, hardly a kindred spirit in my book, but Milton Friedman made the very good point when he was developing his theories, and I'm not competing with Milton Friedman for the prizes he obtained, there's Nobel Prize, but he made the very good point, and you can find it very easily, he said, new ideas, take approximately 30 years to go from being impossible and mad to not only possible but inevitable. I'm not uh, competing, <laughs> but a lot of people have had to wait a lot longer than 30 years before their ideas are taken seriously, so I don't get worried that I've been wasting uh, my time. On the work question, I please ask Anybody who buys the book to please read that chapter 
on the impact of a basic income on work. We need to reconceptualize what we mean by work. Every age, as I constantly argue, has had its stupidity about what is work and what is not work. Our age is the most stupid and sexist of all. And we must keep on saying that because the many forms of work that people do, caring work and other forms of work, are the most valuable socially. But just because of our stupid statistical system, they're treated as non-work. And a basic income would encourage people to reallocate their time. And this is one of the most fundamental reasons for supporting a basic income. It would give a sense of conviviality back. It'd help us have a slow time movement. You know, get control of our time. What's wrong with that, for heaven's sake? What is wrong with that? Now, the last point I want to make is a thing that I quote in the final chapter. It's a delegation that went to see President Roosevelt in the White House in the early 1930s. The delegation, probably people like me, very earnest, they believed in what they were saying. They went along to the White House and he listened to them for an hour and he asked them questions. And then he said, right, you've convinced me. Now go out and make me do it. And I think that is where we are today. We need all of us to say, yeah, this is what we want, and we're going to demand it, because we won't get it unless we demand it. And that's the last point I'd like to say. Thank you very much for coming.